Some time ago, in the comments section, I was asked to consider delving into the operational history of the Bristol M1. I summarised it very briefly in my reply, but of course I couldn't resist some poking around to get more details, and this presentation is the result. I should add that since I wrote the script for the original video, I have uncovered more information which I shall include here. And now I don't propose going into all the details of the Bristol M1. For that I have a presentation that you can find linked below. In brief, it was a single-seat monoplane scout that saw service with the British Royal Flying Corps from late 1917 to the end of the war. It saw first flight in July of 1916 and was notable for its high top speed of 128 miles per hour at 5,000 feet and 132 miles per hour at sea level. However, it was initially refused service, citing its high landing speed and poor downward visibility. I have previously touched on other reasons that it might have been considered undesirable. The initial report on its performance was made at the Central Flying School, and can be said to be less than enthusiastic. The report, number M21, stated, Stability, the lateral, very good, longitudinal, fairly good, directional, good. Length of run to unstick, 85 yards. To pull up, engine stopped, 114 yards. Control. Machine tiring to fly. Requires good pilot. Moderate ease of landing. Machine is nose heavy when gliding. Tendency to turn right with engine on. Writing some years later, test pilot Oliver Stewart, seen here on the far right, rated the M1's manoeuvrability as superior to that of the SE-5A and Sopwith Snipe, but I assume this is a personal recollection rather than the results of simulated dogfights. It seems an unlikely conclusion, as the Sopwith Snipe is considered to have been a very manoeuvrable aircraft, and in general, monoplanes are not normally as manoeuvrable as contemporary biplanes, but I include his opinion for the sake of interest and completeness. Regardless, the War Office was sufficiently impressed by the aircraft's performance to acquire the prototype and order four more for further evaluation. These were designated the M1B and featured a Vickers machine gun in the port wing route and a cutout in the starboard wing route to improve the view during landing. The prototype was rebuilt to include these changes. Two of the pre-production samples were equipped with the 110 horsepower Clerget 9Z, one with a 130 horsepower Clerget 9B, and one the 150 horsepower Admiralty Rotary AR1. These changes saw the top speed drop to 125 miles per hour, although I have no idea how the Admiralty Rotary performed. Testing proceeded in a leisurely fashion. Reasons for this include a lack of enthusiasm for monoplanes, possibly technical reasons involving the armament, and the simultaneous development of more conventional designs that were to prove very successful. I would also throw in a possible perception of the aircraft in that it clearly owed its lineage to pre-war racing monoplanes, especially the Depart du Sens, that might have been seen as too specialist for use as warplanes. One of the M1B models, serial number A5139, was sent to France for flight testing by three experienced pilots, including Lieutenant Durban V. Armstrong and Captain Roderick Hill, both of whom had previously flown Moraine Saulnier monoplanes in No. 60 Squadron. Hill and the third pilot, Captain Alan M. Lowry of 70 Squadron, wrote favourable reports about the Bristol but this appears to have had little effect on the aircraft's acceptance for service. This is generally put down to the RFC's commander, General Hugh Trenchard, having an antipathy towards monoplanes due to the wretched experience with the Moraine Solniers, although this was apparently insufficient to completely cancel the Bristol M1 project as a whole, so clearly there is more to the story. In the Middle East, there was a desperate need for modern fighters, and in response to a request from Brigadier General William G. H. Salmond, pictured in the centre, who was then in command of the RFC in Palestine, 
a motley collection of aircraft were sent to form 111 Squadron, flying Vickers FB-19 Bullets, Bristol F-2Bs, Airco DH-2s and a single Bristol Scout D. Additionally, arriving at the depot in Egypt in June of 1917, were three Bristol M1Bs. Their serial numbers were A5140, A5141 and A5142. They initially joined No. 14 Squadron, where A5140 crashed on August 3rd after suffering engine failure on takeoff. They were then transferred to 111 Squadron, joining A Flight a week after its formation on the 1st of August. Apparently they were popular with their pilots, but it was quickly determined that they had insufficient endurance for escorting reconnaissance missions over the long distance involved in the war in the desert, and so their usefulness was severely limited. A5142 was modified, apparently in the field, by uncovering both wing root panels, and the machine gun repositioned to a central location in front of the pilot. Lieutenant William S. Lighthall, a Canadian pilot in No. 111 Squadron, recorded his impressions of the M1B in desert service. He says, These were far ahead of their time aerodynamically, but were fragile and difficult to get in and out of due to a low triangle of struts over the pilot's cockpit, and the close proximity of the Vickers gun, which had a tendency to break the pilot's nose in a bad landing. Early combat was less than successful, although in fairness, with a test sample of only the two surviving machines, not much could be expected. On the 29th of October, Lieutenant A. H. Peck engaged a Rumpler in A5142, but was unable to bring it down. A5141 ran out of fuel on the 25th of November and landed in Turkish territory. Uh, the pilot, one Edgar Percival, was able to make his way back to his base and the aircraft was eventually recovered and assigned to a training unit. On the 2nd of December, A5142 crashed and was returned to the depot for repair. Its last known operational flight was made shortly afterwards when it took off to pursue an enemy aircraft that strayed over the aerodrome, but failed to intercept. 111 Squadron history has this to say about the Bristol monoplanes. They had some usefulness in that they made it a little more difficult for the enemy airmen to reconnoitre, except from great heights, but their very limited endurance prevented them from being used to escort the long-distance strategical reconnaissance aeroplanes. Major General W. Sefton Branker, who took command of the Middle East Brigade in October 1917, wrote, The Bristol monoplanes and Vickers bullets are not very much good except to frighten the Hun. They always seem to lose the enemy as soon as he starts manoeuvring. However, this conclusion had no effect on the operational history of the aircraft, as on the 3rd of August, 1917, a contract had been placed for 125 Bristol M1Cs. These differed from the M1Bs in that they were fitted with a 100 horsepower Lerone 9JA engine, had their single Vickers machine gun mounted in front of the pilot, synchronized to fire through the propeller arc by the Constantinesco interrupter gear, and had wing root cutouts in both wings to improve the pilot's downward view during landings. Top speed was reportedly 130 miles per hour. Production proceeded quickly, with the first aircraft being delivered on the 19th of September 1917. By the end of 1917, 15 had been dispatched to the depot in Egypt, followed by another 18 in the new year. Fewer than 20 saw active service, some of the remainder staying in Egypt for use in training at Heliopolis. In early January 1918, a handful of M1Cs were shipped to No. 17 and 24 squadrons in Macedonia. When the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service were amalgamated into the Royal Air Force, commencing 1st April 1918, a Flight of No. 17 Squadron and B Flight of No. 24 were merged to form 150 Squadron. Although a fighter squadron, its equipment was far from homogeneous, uh, consisting of SE-5As, Bristol M1Cs and Newports, 
to be joined later by Sopwith Camels. It was with 150 Squadron that the M1C finally got to demonstrate its worth in air-to-air -air combat. On the 25th of April, Lieutenant Arthur Equem de Montaigne Jarvis, then still officially on number 17 Squadron's roster, fired 150 rounds at a DFWCV over Yenema and last saw it descending in a steep dive towards Rulep Pass. Later that same morning, he and Lieutenant Acheson G. Goulding, the latter in an SE-5A, attacked another DFW near Nihor, and in spite of the attempted intervention of two Albatross D-3s, sent it down over Angista, apparently on fire. The next day, Jarvis in his M1C and Lieutenant J.J. Boyd Harvey in a Newport attacked a DFW over Prosenic and sent it crashing into Christos Gully. On the 16th of June, Harvey attacked a Rumpler and believed he had shot it down but was unable to observe as he was attacked by an Albatross D3, though he managed to break away. Another 150 Squadron pilot, Lieutenant K.B. Mosley, shot down an Albatross D5 on the 9th of July and then claimed a DFW on the 26th of July. This is where the combat record of the Bristol M1C gets rather hazy. There is an oft-repeated report that one pilot made ace in an M1C, Captain Frederick Dudley Travers, and includes in this the account that he shot down a Fokker D7. There are a couple of variations on this story. Both begin with his victory flying a BE-12. One then states that he shot down five enemy aircraft flying a Bristol M1C and then scored further victories in an SE-5A. Another version claims that he scored three victories in an SE-5A and then switched to the Bristol M1C in which he scored five more. In an aside, how he managed an air-to-air -air victory in a BE-12 is utterly beyond me. That he scored nine air-to-air -air victories is not disputed, uh, but the aircraft in which he achieved them is. A recent perusal of the records of 150 Squadron apparently shows that all his victories after that gained in a BE-12 were actually earned in an SE-5A, and that furthermore, as the commander of B-Flight, he did not have access to an M1C, which were all flown by A-Flight. The squadron records officially show Travers as flying an SE-5A for all his air-to-air -air victories. Now this information comes from the National Archives, but unfortunately the sources haven't been digitized yet, so I was unable to double-check for myself. However, there is a sort of confirmation of the confusion in the form of Travers' combat report for the 4th of September 1918, pictured here on the left in which he clearly states that he was flying an SE-5A serial number 4176, when the internet reports that he was flying a Bristol M1C. The most likely explanation for this legend, repeated in at least two books, is confusion between names. Someone who was definitely flying Bristol M1Cs with 150 Squadron was Lieutenant James Pomeroy Cavers, and he claimed three aircraft shot down so the most likely explanation is confusion between the rather similar surnames, either that or romantic notions about the Bristol. Cavers, unfortunately, did not survive the war, being shot down on the 3rd of September 1918 while flying an M1C. He survived the crash into Dojran Lake, but was machine-gunned from the air while swimming away. By the end of September, the Bristols were replaced by SE-5As and Sopwith Camels, marking the end of their involvement in that region of the war. On March the 2nd, 1918, No. 72 Squadron arrived at Basra, equipped with DH-4s, SE-5As, SPADs and eight Bristol M1Cs. Two of the latter made a possibly unique contribution to aerial warfare when they induced a tribe of Kurds to switch sides from the Turks to the British by engaging in an aerobatic display over their heads. Other than that, the Bristols apparently gave good service in the ground attack role, and this is attributed to their lack of suitability for bomber and reconnaissance escort missions. The squadron assisted in the capture of Kifri and Kirkuk, 
It was common practice to remove the Bristol's distinctive propeller spinner, which spoiled the streamlining, presumably affected their top speed, but greatly improved engine cooling. In mid-1918, six, or possibly twelve, M1Cs, accounts vary, were shipped to Chile as part payment for the battleships Almirante La Torre and Almirante Cochrane, which were built in British shipyards and taken over by the Royal Navy upon completion, on the grounds that the British need for them was greater than that of the Chileans, given the ongoing World War I. One of these aircraft was the first to fly over the Andes, piloted by Lieutenant Dagoberto Godoy from Santiago to Mendoza in Argentina on the 12th of December 1918. Flight magazine related the account in its issue of December 19th, 1918 as follows. The following announcement was made by the Chilean Minister of War at Santiago de Chile on December 12th. This morning, Lieutenant Godoy of the Military School of Aviation flew from Santiago to Mendoza in the Argentine in an hour and a half, flying over the Cordilleras of the Andes and establishing a height record. The aeroplane used was an English Bristol. The Minister of War takes this opportunity of congratulating the British government on the excellence of the British aeroplane and feels that the result of the flight does the greatest honour to the instruction given to Chilean airmen by the British Major Houston. Another telegram from Santiago says that Lieutenant Godoy flew from Espeo to Mendoza, a distance of 247 miles in 1 hour 28 minutes, at an average height of 20,000 feet. Of the remaining 80 or so aircraft built, none saw combat service, but an unknown number were assigned to training units, especially to the schools of aerial fighting based at Turnbury, Montrose, Hounslow and Mask by the Sea, where they were often adopted as the personal aircraft of instructors and occasionally painted in colourful schemes. The last production M1C received possibly the most elaborate markings applied to the type at Number 3 School of Aerial Fighting in Bircham, Newton. The armistice didn't see the complete end of the Bristol M1C. Bristol themselves bought back four aircraft for the Aircraft Disposal Board for reconditioning and resale. One was sold in the United States, and another in Spain to Señor Juan Pombo in 1921. A third joined the Civil Register as GEASR and was used as a demonstrator. A fourth, registered GEAVP, was employed in the trials of the Bristol Lucifer 100 horsepower three cylinder radial engine and designated as the M1D. Piloted by Cyril Unwins, it debuted at Croydon on the 17th of April 1922, where he came third in the first race and second in the second race. On the 3rd of June, at the Croydon Whitson meeting, he won the handicap race. On the 7th of August, with Larry Carter at the controls, it won the Aerial Derby Handicap. In the first King's Cup race a month later, it was flown by Rollo de Hager Haig, but was unable to complete due to engine trouble. The M1D was fitted with a 140 horsepower Lucifer engine to compete for the Grosvenor Cup on the 23rd of June 1923, piloted by the very popular Ernest Leslie Foote. However, during the race, it crashed at Chertsey while en route to Croydon, killing its pilot. Bristol withdrew their entries from the Aerial Derby and King's Cup races in 1923 as a tribute to him. Two more were acquired from the Aircraft Disposal Board in 1919. GEAER was flown in the 1919 Aerial Derby by Major C. H. Chichester-Smith. Henry John Butler, who served as an instructor at the School of Aerial Fighting at Mask by the Sea, bought two aircraft, an Avro 504 and an M1C registered as GAUCH when he left the RAF. Both were shipped to his native Australia with a view to starting various enterprises, including passenger flights and air mail delivery. Perhaps Butler's greatest achievement came on August 6, 1919, when he finally arrived home at Minleyton on the first mail delivery across the sea from Adelaide. 
He set off in his Red Devil Bristol monoplane facing gale force winds blowing at 68 miles per hour with a 40 pound mailbag of letters on board for delivery to Minlayton, 62 miles away. He arrived in Minlayton to a crowd of over 6,000 people, some who had never seen a plane flying before. He used the Bristol to win the first Australian aerial derby in 1920. Butler died on July 30, 1924 from an unsuspected cerebral abscess, possibly gained as the result of an earlier crash on the 10th of January 1922 in the Avro 504, which had been of sufficient severity to cut short his flying career. Butler's M1C was put into storage until 1930, when it was bought by H. Miller, who replaced the Le Rhone rotary engine with a Gypsy II inline in 1931. In this configuration, now with the civil registration VHUQI, he won the Adelaide Aerial Derby in 1931 and 1932, and later that year also competed in the Victorian Aerial Derby, but had to retire with engine trouble. After some years flying with the Commercial Aviation Company, it was flown from Adelaide to Perth in 1938, where it was stored in the roof of a hangar at Guildford Airport. It was rediscovered there in 1956 by C.B. Tilbrook, who raised a fund to build an exhibition hall to house it permanently at Minlayton as the Harry Butler Memorial. Restored and painted red, VHUQI is now the only surviving M1C although until 1960 the mouldering remains of Dagoberto Godoy's monoplane still existed at Santiago de Chile.